Welcome to the podcast, Crime Salad, where we talk true crime. I'm your host, Ashley, and with me always is my husband and partner in crime, Ricky. The purpose of this podcast is to honor the victims through ethical storytelling in the hopes of preventing future tragedies. We want our stories to resonate and educate others in hopes that some of these similar cases with identifiable patterns can be prevented. Now, before we jump in, please let us warn you that this is a true crime podcast. The details of this episode may be triggering to some listeners. Listener discretion advised. In 1996, 19-year-old Kristen Smart, a student at California Polytechnic State University, or Cal Poly as it's called by students and locals, disappeared while walking back to her dorm after attending an off-campus party. Her case remained unsolved for decades until September of 2019. That is when Chris Lambert, A California Central Coast native started a true crime podcast about Kristen's disappearance called Your Own Backyard. He would often drive past the large local missing person billboard with Kristen's face on it, which piqued his curiosity. Almost immediately, he found new witnesses with new leads in Kristen's case. And sometimes witnesses came forward with old information too. As he continued, it became clear that there was more than enough information early on in this case to point authorities to a suspect. Due to Chris's investigative work, the police finally arrested Paul Flores, a former classmate of Kristen's. In 2021, he was arrested and charged with Kristen's murder. But he wasn't alone in those charges. His father, Ruben Flores, was also charged as an accessory to murder after the fact. Now, before we discuss Paul and Ruben's arrest and trial, let's go back to that night on May 25th, 1996, when Kristen disappeared. It would sadly be the last day of her young life. It was Memorial Day weekend and Kristen was staying on campus and like many students her age, looking for a local party to attend. She went out with her friend Margarita and the two shared one beer between them. By 10.30 p.m., Margarita wanted to go home, and Kristen wanted to go out to one more party. As a result, her friends dropped her off at an off-campus party located at 135 Crandall Way in San Luis Obispo. Kristen was alone, and as often her habit, she would create a nickname or alternative persona for herself. That night, she was telling everyone her name was Roxy. She was last seen wearing a gray crop tank top, black running shorts, and her signature red and white Puma athletic shoes. According to numerous witnesses that night, she didn't appear to be drinking. However, she quickly appeared to be intoxicated. She was allegedly approaching many of the students in a flirtatious manner, rubbing up against some of them and kissing others. So basically normal college freshman behavior as Kristen enjoyed her newfound independence while deciding who she was going to be in life. Now, the way her behavior would later be described in police reports and during interviews with witnesses was nothing short of victim blaming and misogyny. But this was the 90s and this case was originally investigated through the lens of that time period. In today's world, investigators and consumers of true crime know better than to ever blame a victim for their own rape or murder. Now, let's go back to that night in question. Unfortunately for Kristen, there was another classmate there that night with nefarious intent. Paul Flores, also a college freshman, was behaving extremely aggressively towards the other women there and seemed to have a particular interest in Kristen. It was like he was stalking her throughout the night, trying to be wherever she was, hovering and talking to her any chance that he could get. Although, just a week later, Paul would deny knowing Roxy prior to the party or even interacting with her that night, but witnesses would contradict almost everything Paul would later tell the police. Tim Davis, one of the young men throwing the party, remembered hearing a loud thud and then seeing Kristen falling on top of Paul in the hallway. Kristen is listed as between six feet and six one in height, something Paul would later use as proof of his disinterest in her. 
Well, that fall in the hallway was also witnessed by Kendra Coed, and she helped Smart to her feet despite Paul's assertions that they didn't need her help. Kristen, who was a tall, striking blonde, made an impression on quite a few of the young men at the party that night. At one point, she began talking to Matt Toomey and Ross Ketchum. They both noticed she appeared to be extremely intoxicated. Matt remembered an encounter where Chris, or Roxy as she was going by that night, asked him if he found her attractive. After briefly kissing someone in the bathroom, she exited, only to find Paul Flores waiting for her, hoping to catch her attention. He did catch her attention, but only after she had passed out on the front lawn of the house on Crandall Way. It was Tim Davis who found Kristen laying on the front lawn of the neighboring residence, seemingly passed out from alcohol consumption. This despite no one seeing her drink very much that night. And we know from her friend Margarita, she arrived at the party a few hours early, completely sober. Tim asked his friend Cheryl Anderson, who he knew also lived in the Cal Poly dorms, if she would walk Kristen back to her dorm. Of course, Cheryl agreed, but that is when Paul Flores popped out of the shadows and told Tim that he also lived by the dorms too, and he would be happy to walk Kristen back as their dorms were both very close to each other. Tim and Cheryl were immediately suspicious of Paul's intentions, and Cheryl insisted that she would go along to help escort Kristen back home. And Tim wasn't sure if he should leave both women to Paul's custody, and asked Cheryl if she was sure that she felt safe walking back with Paul. She assured him that she would be fine, and after 25 years later, Tim Davis would still regret that decision. As the three walked together towards campus on Perimeter Road, Cheryl noticed that Kristen was having trouble walking. Paul had his arm around Kristen, and she was leaning on him as he led her back to campus. Throughout the walk, Paul kept stopping and wrapping his arms around Kristen in an awkward hug. And each time he stopped, he suggested that Cheryl walk without them as he didn't want to slow her down. It became very apparent to Cheryl that Paul wanted her to leave, which made her all the more determined to stay. Cheryl noticed that each time Paul stopped to hug Kristen, she didn't hug him back. Her arms were limply draped over his shoulders. According to the arrest warrant for Paul Flores, as the three continued walking on Perimeter Road and Grand Avenue, there was a decision to be made. All three were very close to their dorms. Cheryl's dorm would take her left at the crossroads, and Kristen and Paul's dorms would take them both right at the crossroads. That is when Paul asked Cheryl if she would kiss him, and she said no. As a result of this interaction, she made the fateful decision to leave Kristen in Paul's care, custody, and control. And Kristen Smart would never be seen alive again. It was the next morning, and one of Kristen's roommates noticed she was missing. Her keys and her wallet were still on her bed, and all of her things were still where she last placed them. The night before, Margarita had given Kristen her dorm key to get back into the building. Kristen had never returned the key, also proving she had never returned back that night. Jennifer Phipps called campus police, who refused to take a report. It was a holiday weekend, and they assumed that Kristen had taken off for the weekend with friends. When Kristen still hadn't returned by Tuesday, May 28, 1996, Jennifer again tried to report Kristen missing. Getting nowhere with campus police, she decided to call the San Luis Obispo Police Department. Police finally took a report and learned from Crystal Calvin, Kristen's other roommate, that Kristen hadn't been seen since the early evening hours of May 24th. So it has now been four days since Kristen has gone missing, and police still didn't know that they were four days behind her killer. Crystal told police that Kristen would often stay out all night, but she always returned in the morning, and she also knew that Kristen would never stay overnight without her makeup, her toiletries, and her wallet. All of those items were still in the same positions as they were Friday night when she was last seen. At first, the police wanted to make sure that Kristen hadn't gone home, so they called her parents, Stan and Denise Smart, who were immediately alarmed. Kristen, who was the oldest of the three children, was usually responsible and reliable. She had a standing tradition to call her parents every Sunday night, and she would talk to her younger brother and sister to catch up on the week's events. And when she didn't call that last Sunday, they assumed that she maybe got busy with her friends, but now they were frantic. 
It didn't take police long to trace Kristen's last known steps, and that led them to Paul Flores. The first thing police noticed about Paul was he was extremely nervous. His heart was pounding out of his chest, and he had a black eye that was in the late stages of healing. It appeared to be about three to four days old. Paul would tell law enforcement that he got the black eye while playing basketball with some friends. He explained he took an elbow to the face and he gave the names of the students he had played with. Paul immediately tried to distance himself from the investigation. He told authorities he barely knew Kristen, he barely talked to her at the party, and he still thought her name was Roxy. He explained that he only walked her another few feet when he had to go into the opposite direction to get to his dorm. And as he was walking towards the Santa Lucia dorm, he saw Kristen heading towards the Muir dorm, which was about two football fields away from where he last saw her. But according to Cheryl, there would have been no way that Kristen could have made it to her dorm alone in the condition that she would have been when she last saw her. She told them Kristen was completely impaired and couldn't walk unassisted. There would have been no way for her to suddenly sober up enough to walk to her dorm alone without Paul's assistance. So almost immediately, police knew that Paul knew more than what he was saying. And when they talked to Paul's friends, who allegedly elbowed him in the eye, they got a conflicting story. One of those friends picked Paul up from Ruben Flores' house on Sunday night. Ruben is Paul's dad. And when they picked him up, they learned that Paul was no longer in possession of his Green Ranger truck, and also noticed Paul had a black eye. When he asked Paul how he got the black eye, Paul told him that he was working on the radio in his truck and he hit his eye on the steering wheel. Police immediately knew he was lying, and they confronted him on the fact. They told him they knew he didn't get a black eye playing basketball, and they knew he told his friend an entirely different story. That's when Paul called his lies little white lies because he was embarrassed to say he woke up with a black eye and probably hit himself in the night. Again, this explanation didn't make any sense to the police. Police immediately began organizing search efforts looking for Kristen in the hills behind the dorms. Unfortunately, search and rescue dogs couldn't pick up her scent. That is when they decided to use cadaver dogs. They brought in four separate cadaver dogs to Paul's dorm and to Kristen's dorm. All four dogs were given access to all the rooms on the floors. Each time, all of the cadaver dogs indicated human remains on the bed that belonged to Paul. Paul had moved out all of his things weeks earlier, yet they still hit on the mattress last used by Paul. Police removed that mattress, and once again, they had all four dogs walk through all of the floors with all the doors open. Again, all four dogs separately indicated the scent of human decomposition in the spot where Paul's mattress had previously been. So this confirmed their suspicion that Kristen was no longer alive. It also appeared she didn't live past her last encounter with Paul Flores. At first, Paul was cooperative and came in for several interviews. On May 30th, 1996, police again asked Paul to come down to the police station for an interview. Again, Paul was extremely nervous and he couldn't get out a complete sentence without a lot of uhs and ums. This time, they wanted Paul to go over the night's events backward. They wanted him to begin the story where he last saw Kristen, which was the crossroads where they each allegedly went their separate ways. Paul insisted that Kristen was walking just fine, and her only problem was that she was cold and kept asking him for hugs to warm her up. He was able to explain the events backward up until he got to the part where they were last walking with Cheryl. That is when he began changing the subject. He told authorities that he didn't know Kristen before that night, which we will learn later, that was a complete lie. He had been interested in Kristen for months and had talked with her several times over the last several weeks. But he insisted to law enforcement that not only didn't he know Kristen, but he also assured them he wasn't attracted to her either. For someone who barely knew she existed before offering to escort her to her dorm, he sure had a lot of details about that night. He told authorities that she approached every guy at the party, asking them if they liked her except for him. He described her behavior as overly flirtatious and described her to a friend as a, quote, dirty slut. 
He told investigators that even if a girl like that had wanted him, he wouldn't have been interested because he was worried about sexually transmitted diseases. Paul said that others at the party were making fun of Kristen's behavior as well as her nickname. But none of that was corroborated by witnesses. The detectives asked Paul if anyone had used nicknames for him, and he offered up the name Polly Short, but they had something more specific in mind. They told Paul that other students had named him Chester the Molester because of his behavior with girls, and this was a name that Paul denied ever being called. Police told Paul that this investigation was deadly serious, and it wouldn't go away until Kristen was found. They wanted him to know that this was a serious matter, and it was even more severe for him because he was the last person to see Kristen alive. Law enforcement told him that they had interviewed over 25 witnesses and discovered that Kristen had a reputation for being promiscuous, and he had a reputation for being called Chester the Molester. They told him, quote, Okay, Paul, so here we have a guy named Chester the Molester, and he was last seen walking up the hill with a very promiscuous woman. I'm putting it kindly from what some of these other witnesses have said. We believe that Roxy was intimate with several individuals. So we have this massively promiscuous individual, and you're claiming that there was nothing that went on, unquote. Investigators were not buying Paul's story that he didn't make a move on Kristen that night, and they flat out told him he was lying to them. They told Paul that he was going to need an alibi for them to move on to another suspect. Paul told them his roommate was out of town that weekend, and he was all alone in his dorm room. Paul also told law enforcement that he had never had sex with a woman and had only kissed one over Christmas break. Once again, Paul insisted he wasn't attracted to Kristen because she was drunk and was flirty and was much taller than him. Now, police learned that Paul wasn't even invited to the party that night and had crashed it on his way to his sister's house. Later, police discovered that Paul called his sister in the early morning hours after Kristen was last seen. They also figured out that someone could easily park behind Paul's dorm and the car would be the perfect height for unloading a body out of his dorm window into an awaiting vehicle. And we will get into Paul's sister's car later in this episode. Paul's older sister, Air Melinda, was also a student at Cal Poly. And if you remember, police became aware from Paul's friend that Paul no longer had his Green Ranger truck. They were starting to put together how Paul could have disposed of Kristen's body with the help of his family. His truck was sold two months later, and Paul's father transferred the title to an older white truck into Paul's name at the end of the summer. Despite all of the circumstantial evidence pointing towards him, Paul insisted that he didn't know what happened to Kristen. He told authorities he was very drunk that night himself, and he couldn't remember what happened other than he recalled throwing up sometime in the night. Paul had been arrested for a DUI in February of 1996, and he explained away all transferring of vehicles to his DUI. He came in for one more interview on June 19, 1996, and Detective Hobston told Paul, quote, There is no doubt in our minds that you know what happened to Roxy, unquote. Paul nodded his head up and down and said, yeah. And when they asked him what he thought happened to Kristen, he said, quote, I don't know. I think she's dead. I think someone put her in the car and took her someplace. I don't know. Police thought it was odd that he used the phrase the car instead of a car, and they believed they got him in a slip of the tongue. After that interview, Paul stopped cooperating with the police. The Smart family was understandably upset over the lack of progress in their daughter's case. They contacted the FBI, who offered to come in and assist with the investigation. However, the local police department declined their services. For years, Kristen's case went seemingly cold. However, in 2003, it appears from the case file that leading detective at the time and Sheriff Parkinson met with the Smart family attorney, Jim Murphy. They wanted to discuss offering Paul Flores a plea bargain in exchange for their daughter's remains. The year before, in 2002, Kristen had been declared legally dead by a court of law. The Smart family wanted answers. They wanted closure. They wanted to bring their daughter home and lay her to rest. 
Paul's attorney had counteroffered with a low-level criminal charge, which was the equivalent of a small minor criminal infraction. The negotiations went nowhere, with neither side agreeing to terms. On May 2, 2010, former District Attorney Shea created a document entitled Spart File 5-7-2010. In that file, he made a notation that Paul's attorney stated, quote, I just wanted to say one thing, and I shouldn't even be saying this. But if you'll come to me with an offer for involuntary charge with only one condition, and that is that, and he'll agree to take law enforcement to the body, then I can make that deal happen. After those second negotiations fell apart, Kristen's case didn't have another significant lead until September 2019 when Chris Lampert, with the cooperation of the Smart family, started his podcast investigating Kristen's murder. Once the sheriff's department realized that this podcast was providing them with new leads, they authorized the current detective in charge of Kristen's case, Detective Cole, to appear on an episode of Chris's podcast asking for anyone with information on Kristen's murder to come forward. As a result, on November 18, 2019, law enforcement met with a witness named Jennifer Hudson. Hudson was only 17 years old in the summer of 1996, when she would frequent a house with her boyfriend Brent Moon, where they had a large skateboarding ramp. Jennifer told Detective Cole that sometime between the end of August 1996 and the beginning of September 1996, she met Paul Flores at that ramp. Jennifer said that while in Paul's presence, a radio or TV ad about Kristen Smart's disappearance had played. Jennifer told authorities that she vividly recalled Paul calling Kristen a dick tease. She recalled him saying something to the effect of, quote, That bitch dick teaser, we were at a party with this bitch and all she did was lead me on. And I finally had enough of her shit, so I took care of her. So I buried her either under or next to the skate ramp at my place in Wasna. Jennifer specifically recalled him using the words, my place, which at the time would have been his father's house. Jennifer remembered a second time that she saw Flores again. She was giving two friends a ride to a different skate ramp at somebody's house in Wasna. A few minutes later, someone arrived in an older, white-lifted 4x4 truck. When that person got out, she realized she was at Paul Flores' home, and this was where he told her that he had buried Kristen's body the last time they had met. Jennifer immediately stepped out of her car and threw up on the ground. When Detective Cole gave Jennifer a photo lineup, she positively identified Paul Flores. Now, by this time, Paul had already been in the news because of the podcast, so this identity wasn't that surprising. Next, Detective Cole showed Jennifer a photo lineup of several different properties. She immediately identified Ruben Flores' home, a home where Paul was living in the summer of 1996. There was another incident from that summer in 1996, which police were already aware of from an incident in August. Paul showed up at a woman's house in the middle of the night, ringing her doorbell and asking her to open the door and hug him. When she told him to leave, he climbed up on her balcony and started pounding on her sliding glass door. She called the San Lupis Obispo Police Department and they gave Paul a warning not to return to the property or they would charge him with trespassing. But Jennifer wasn't the only new witness to come forward because of Chris's podcast. Another witness, whose name was redacted from the arrest affidavit, came forward to say she worked with Paul Flores in early 2013 at a Coca-Cola plant in Los Angeles. While working with Paul, he would repeatedly ask her to get drinks with him. She firmly told him that she didn't drink alcohol and she wasn't interested in dating him. In response, he allegedly told her that instead, they could go to a hotel where she could pass out. This witness found his statement odd because she didn't drink, so she wasn't sure why he assumed that she would pass out if they went out together. Now, you would think that Paul Flores would be on his best behavior after seemingly getting away with Kristen's murder for 15 years, but you would be wrong. On July 6, 2011, police were able to match Paul's DNA from CODIS to a rape case back in 2007. In that case, a female victim reported an alleged rape to the Redondo Beach Police Department. 
The unnamed victim met some friends at the Backstreet Bar in Redondo Beach, California. And while there, she had several drinks and possibly up to five beers. At one point in the evening, she left her drink unattended and went outside and smoked two cigarettes. Once she returned inside, she finished her drink and immediately began feeling disoriented. That is the last thing she remembered until she woke up the next day inside of an unknown residence, naked and wrapped in a blanket. After leaving the home, she went directly to the hospital and requested a sexual assault exam. When police were called, she told them she had no independent memory of meeting the owner of the home where she woke up. She also had no memory of consenting to sexual intercourse with him. The exam showed injuries to her rectum and vagina, which could be consistent with sexual assault. Because she had no independent memory, the sexual assault allegations against Paul were never prosecuted. Despite all of this information, one attempted break-in, and another definitive confirmation of rape with Paul's DNA, it's shocking that Paul was never arrested and charged with Kristen's murder. However, throughout the years, there were sporadic searches done of various places associated with Paul, and one of those properties was Paul's mother's home. Police received a report from her tenant of finding an earring in the back of the property where cadaver dogs had previously alerted. This earring was turned over to the sheriff's department, and then it was lost. The area where it was found had previously been inspected with ground-penetrating radar, which indicated that there was an area of disturbance that could have one time contained a grave. But all of those leads led nowhere. In fact, in 2003, the Smart family had filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Paul Flores shortly after Kristen had been legally declared dead. Unfortunately, it didn't lead to the information that they were seeking, which was to find Kristen's remains and lead to his arrest. Paul pleaded the fifth during the discovery process, and the sheriff's office asked for an automatic stay concerning their criminal file. They told the court that Kristen's case had never gone cold, and someone was continually working on it every day. In retaliation, the Flores family also filed a lawsuit against the Smart family for the willful infliction of emotional distress and defamation, but their lawsuit was eventually dismissed too. With the renewed interest from the public and the many witnesses coming forward from the podcast, the Sheriff's Department served a series of new search warrants. They were served at multiple locations, including Paul's home in San Pedro, his mother's home in Arroyo Grande, and his father's home, also in Arroyo Grande. At Ruben Flores' home, they found numerous missing persons flyers and newspaper articles for Kristen Smart. However, it was on Paul's electronic devices that they would find the evidence that would eventually find its way to a courtroom in Paul's trial. While most of the evidence wasn't allowed to be admitted due to its prejudicial value, one pertinent photo led to two witnesses who were allowed to testify at trial. That evidence included Paul's collection of homemade pornography, which was contained with a file labeled Practice, all of which was shot inside his same bedroom in the same house where they served the search warrant. Paul's face appeared in several of them, and his voice could be heard in all of them. But homemade pornography isn't illegal, as long as the other person involved can fully consent. It's clear from Paul's videos that consent is something he doesn't want in any of his special homemade movies. In all of them, there was little to no movement by the female subjects. All of them appeared to be in various stages of unconsciousness, and none of them seemed coherent or alert enough to consent. Some of them were completely passed out and unable to consent or participate. In all of the videos, Paul can be seen either sodomizing them or digitally or vaginally penetrating them against their will. Of great significance was Paul's use of a sex toy called a ball gag. Paul's ball gag had a red ball with black straps attached and he used it throughout many of his videos, even when his victims were unconscious. The trial judge in Paul's case allowed one still image of one of his victims with the same red ball gag in her mouth. It became significant because two separate women testified at Paul's trial that Paul forcefully placed the ball gag in their mouths without their consent and then proceeded to sodomize and rape them. 
Now, Paul was never tried for these crimes, but their testimony was allowed in as evidence to show Paul's regular custom and practice of forcing himself on drunken and drugged women. Both women reported that they were unable to remember large portions of their night and believed that they were drugged by the defendant. In that regard, police also found several bottles of a drug called Flexerol in his medicine cabinet, along with a drug prescribed for dogs called Tramadol. Both of these drugs would dissolve in liquid and shouldn't be combined with alcohol. Also found during the search of Paul's home was his collection of pornography, which included a large selection of child pornography. From a review of the videos and still images, it appeared that Paul preferred pornography with rape fantasies of drunken, impaired, drugged, and unconscious women. Investigators believed his preference for predatory pornography was a direct correlation to Kristen Smart's disappearance. After investigators served the search warrants, they were able to get an order to record all electronic communications between members of the Flores family. In one of the recorded calls, Susan Flores, Paul's mom, called to discuss Kristen's case and more specifically, Chris Lambert's podcast. She told Paul she wanted to come visit him at his house in San Pedro and help him get his affairs in order. She told him she believed he would eventually be arrested for Kristen's murder. She said it matter-of-factly, as if she knew something. She wanted Paul to show her how to care for his dogs in his absence and prepare for his defense. She told him, quote, The other thing I need you to do is to start listening to the podcast. I need you to listen to everything they say so we can punch holes in it. Um, wherever we can punch holes. Maybe we can't. You, you're the one that can tell me. End quote. In another call, Susan again told her son that she had been listening to the podcast and she expected him to be arrested. She told him his bail would likely be too high for her to pay, so she would need to get his finances in order quickly. Those phone calls took place in early 2020. Police began to believe that Kristen's body had originally been buried or at least stored at his mother's house and later moved to his father's house and placed under his deck in February of 2021, they spoke with David Stone, who rented a room from Ruben Flores for 10 years. And he told authorities he was convinced that Paul was responsible for Kristen's disappearance and that Ruben had helped his son dispose of her body. He said there was a lattice-covered deck on the property with a small half-door that led to the crawl space under the deck. He said it was padlocked the entire time he lived there and Ruben wouldn't allow anyone to access it. He said at one time, there was a water leak in the kitchen. David told authorities that Reuben would not allow the servicemen to go under the deck and fix the leak. Instead, he sent them away and said he would fix the leak himself. David also told authorities that Reuben had a Volkswagen car in his garage that belonged to his daughter in college. Even though his daughter had a new car, he said that he would never sell it and it sat in his garage for 25 years. On March 15, 2021, police were finally able to search the area under Ruben's deck. A large hole in the ground under the deck was about four feet deep and six feet wide. The excavator said that it was a good size hole and the perimeters were consistent with the burial site. This is where the dueling experts enter the picture. Paul and Ruben were tried together with separate juries. The prosecution had experts who tested the soil and said that they tested positive for human decomposition as well as positive for blood or other bodily fluids mixed in with the soil consistent with a burial site. However, the defense had experts who said it's possible to have a false positive in cases where the soil was instead mixed with ferret or even weasel blood. Allegedly, Ruben had a weasel problem, and his expert surmised the prosecution was offering up a junk science or pseudoscience because they had no real evidence against his client. It's obvious one jury agreed with the prosecution and one did not. Ruben's jury found him innocent of accessory after the fact. However, Paul's jury found him guilty of the murder of Kristen Smart. Paul's attorney had filed a motion for a new trial which will delay the sentencing in this case and as of today's date, Paul is scheduled to be sentenced in March of 2023. And throughout the trial, Chris Lambert's podcast was used as a defense theory. They theorized that all of these witnesses suddenly came forward after the podcast because they were either interested in the reward or notoriety. Paul's attorney is right about one thing. 
None of those new witnesses would have come forward without Chris Lampert's podcast. His podcast on this case has been credited with playing a significant role in bringing new attention to Kristen's case and ultimately leading to the arrest of two suspects. That is evident by how prominently the podcast was discussed throughout Paul's trial. For decades, Paul believed he had gotten away with murder. He never could have imagined that his true crime podcast would be his ultimate undoing. It provided a platform for people to come forward with new information, and it helped to keep this case in the public's consciousness. Without it, this case may have just remained cold. As true crime consumers, we all know the pursuit of justice is never over. We hope by continuing to highlight these cases, we prevent or reduce the next one. The popularity in true crime has taught us about the buddy system and how to protect our drinks or to stay in groups when you're out having fun. With this knowledge comes the power for people to keep themselves safe. And we want to send a special thank you to those that support us through Patreon. Thanks for being a part of Crime Salad. You guys are so awesome. This week, let's welcome Heather, Allison, Dawn, Tori, Christine A, Christine S, and Shamir. Enjoy the ad-free listens and bonus content. And as always, thank you for listening and be sure to subscribe wherever you're listening so you don't miss an episode. And if you're really liking the show, please help support us by giving us a helpful review and follow us on social media. And thank you again for hanging out with us. We'll see you next week. <laughs>